don't be afraid to be miserable. I mean, it sucks, right? Like no one, like diarrhea sucks. Puking sucks. Right? <laughs> like, like I know these things, like when you're in the middle of them, you're like, Oh my God, this is never ending. I want to no, like, just like I'll trade anything to make this stop. Like being miserable sucks, but don't be afraid of it. Right. Like it, there's profoundness in it. There's wisdom in it. It shows who you really are. Like, you know, watch somebody when they're in the best of times, they're great people. Watch somebody in the worst of times and you see who they really are. And I'm not wishing terrible times on everyone, but don't be afraid to be miserable. And, and if people need examples of this, one of, one of the things I love to do actually is just read history, like read the histories of people who have created your, the greatest works that you admire, because they're not these beautiful little stories. And if people have written them as beautiful stories, remember that that's writing and that might not actually be true. Um, because people who are living the life and living the experience are often going through, I mean, Mark Twain was an insurance salesman. Like he wrote his books at night. He wrote his books after he could finish his job, make the paycheck. Like a lot of the people we admire the most are the loneliest, weirdest, strangest, most miserable people ever. So if, <laughs> like, if we're looking for doing great work and if that's the priority, and I, I would argue that like doing great work and having great love are some of the biggest, biggest, if not the ultimate things in life, mm-hmm. um, then, then like there's, then you're just going to, get the gamut of emotions and some of it's going to be not so good. I actually, I think that, I think that society like preaching right now, the, the do what you love, follow your passion, everything should be great. Happiness ideal is actually doing a lot of people a disservice because yeah. then they chase after things that just feel good and things that just feel good right now are McDonald's and sitting on my couch and watching a movie. And then I feel like shit later. Cause I know I'm capable of more. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Sarah, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Hey, Srini. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. I mean, you've been a long requested guest uh, by many of our listeners. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I, I've been following your work for quite some time. I mean, I've, oh, I remember thinking, I, I remember sitting at a dinner with you several years ago when we met in San Francisco and I was like, wow, I've never seen somebody take so many notes in a moleskin. <laughs> I mean, you're really, a, you're a writer in every sense of the word. I mean, I, I, and, and, you know, I've always appreciated your voice as a writer. I mean, you're one of my favorite people to read. Um, you know, and I remember I would be, you know, I'd look at your and Amber's Instagram feeds and think if I only, if I had handwriting like that, I would post all my stuff for my moleskin, but my moleskin is full of chicken scratch, but that's a whole other story. So Sarah, um, <laughs> you've heard our show. So you know what? Let, let's get right into your story. I mean, how do you get to where you're at today? I mean, walk us through this journey of yours that leads to the work that you're doing today. Sure. Oh, wow. I love, I love that you brought in the moleskin reference too, because I'm actually right now in that gap between I finished one moleskin yesterday and my new ones are about to arrive tomorrow. And I'm totally flummoxed because I don't know what to do. I'm kind of in little panic mode because I'm like, what do I write on? How do I do this? (laughs) And you're so right. It's almost a crutch for me. I write down, I scribble things down all the time. It's like I carry the, the common book, if you've heard of it, around with me, just trying to take notes on everything and capture it. Okay. So you asked me a big question though. You said, what's my story? How did I get to where I am? I don't really feel like I am anywhere. I, I, that might be a very Zen kind of strange thing to say, but, um, I've lived a a pretty interesting life for the one that I've been given. And, and I, there have been so many ups and downs and I just, I see it all as like a series of stories unfolding. And I try to share some of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll go back a little bit of time. We can go back about a decade, maybe, maybe more. Um, I, when I left home for the first time, I left when I was very young and I started, started college. And, um, I always had this idea that I was somehow like left out or left behind or not good enough. And it's taken me a number of years to, to realize that that narrative is, um, maybe something I'm just carrying in my mind and not actually true of the world. And, and I went to school, um, and I, I was swimming at the time and I ended up going to one of the hardest training programs of my life. Um, we did 10 practices a week, about six hours a day, college swimming. And, uh, I was a walk on by many, in many senses of the word and 
almost quit a number of times and over the course of four years transformed my life and really ended up um, being becoming this like person who could use my body and swim fast and compete at the national level. And um, it, it included all sorts of things like falling down a flight of stairs, breaking my foot, dislocating my shoulder, like every single th- trial and tribulation that happened within it, it, it was part of it. Um, and I left, I left school, um, left school and I began, I started in the traditional corporate world and uh, started a job. It was, you know, not right for me. And I knew it within two minutes of walking in the door and I ended up staying for almost five years. And I just, it got worse and worse and worse because I wasn't able to move. And I had fallen in love with being able to use my body and be able to swim. And here I was trapped in a job where I had to work 12 to 14 hours a day, sitting behind a desk, unable to move my body. And after about five years of working in this corporate world, um, I started to feel pain in the right side of my body and my, my hand started to hurt a lot. Um, and I ended up going home and I was hanging out with my sister and, and I was doing this thing. I was putting my hair up in a ponytail and I said, you know, my right arm looks kind of funny. And my sister said, yeah, you know, it does. It does. You've got more veins on one side than the other. And I happen to have the whitest of white skin. It's translucent. So like you can see bloody blue veins like popping out. So I called my grandpa who's an MD. And I told him, I said, you know, my arm kind of hurts. And he was like, oh, you know, you might have a little blood clot in your arm. You should, you should head over to the hospital. Um, and I ignored him cause I had a deadline at work. And, uh, the next night the tingling and the numbness in my hand didn't go away. So I, I ended up going into the emergency room to the urgent care center. And they discovered that I had a blood clot the size of a small sausage in the middle of my chest that was blocking all the blood into my arm. And I um, ended up in the hospital for a number of days and they, they ended up uh, cutting open my chest and removing my top rib. And they said, I remember when the doctor looked at me and she said, I just want to let you know that you might never be able to swim again. And I'd been okay, like very pragmatic, very type A in the hospital up until that point. And I just, I, I kind of lost it. My boyfriend at the time left, my mom left. I was alone in a hospital bed with like dozens of IVs coming out of my arms and hands. And um, I just started crying because I realized how badly I wanted to use my body and how much I didn't like what I was doing. And it was a pretty terrible scenario to be in an eight hour hospitalization or eight hour surgery. Um, undergoing this like major blood clot in your chest, maybe you'll live, maybe you won't kind of moment. And I realized that I didn't want to go, I didn't want to, uh, I had to change. I had to do other things. And it took me a while to recover from that. I actually remember it took me about six months to get back into yoga. Um, and then it took me another year to be able to swim again. And uh, once I did start to be able to swim again, I started doing these open water swims. And I joined... I remember the night when I was, um, you know, not my best shining moment, but it certainly turned out well. I was very drunk in a bar and this guy asked me uh, about swimming and I told him very brazenly um, how good I was. I was just like, I'm so great. I'm better than you. Something really classy, I'm sure. Um, And so he challenged me to join his relay team. And so he was what instigated me to do my first open water adventure swim down in Santa Cruz. And, uh, I ended up doing this open water swim and starting to do these Alcatraz swims. And, um, eventually I, I, I mean, now I've now done the Alcatraz swim nine different times and I've done these six and eight, and nine mile open water swims and I'm in New York and I'm doing yoga teacher training and I'm running my own business. It's just life changing. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, so there's a ton here. So I, I want to go back to the very beginning. You probably expect <laughs> okay. this by now since you've heard some of my yes. interviews. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think where I want to start is, is with this sort of narrative you're talking about, this sense that you've felt left out or displaced. I think, to be honest, everybody listening to this show feels that to some degree. Um, I think that's, that's largely what is often the instigator of creative endeavors for many mm-hmm. people. And I'm really curious you, I mean, like one, how we can, if we have that narrative, how we change it. And if we don't change it, how we can turn it into something useful or meaningful or positive. 
Isn't that a good question? You know, it's, it's a really tricky one because like every moment, right. There'll be a moment when I am finishing up a yoga class with many of my friends and three people congregate in the corner. And I just have a twinge of, you know, oh, they're doing something without me, or I feel a little bit left out or this underlying current of loneliness or wondering whether or not I fit in. And I think, you know, I, I am, it's actually the topic of some of my research right now, but I wonder all the time about loneliness and about this, these voices in our head and this ego that's in our head and trying to find the light side of the shadow side, because this is a shadow side of existence. And so what is the light? Like, why is this voice useful? What is it telling me? Where does it come from? And historically speaking, like, we need to trust one another because we need to survive. So we have a huge emphasis on, um, you know, like I need to know that I can go to sleep in the middle of a, in our Neolithic era. I need to know that I can go to sleep and that people will keep me safe and that somebody will find me food and you'll take care of my kids. So it's a survival mechanism for us to trust one another. So it's kind of embedded into our, our hardwiring. Um, and then also I think, and this is just something recently that I've been thinking about I think your ego or your negative voice or whatever it is, it sure, we're certainly working to untangle it. Like I'm constantly working to, to towards peace, to striving towards peace within myself and and in this world. But it's that moment, that voice that sometimes is the instigation. And my yoga teacher always tells me, she's like, don't be too hard on your ego because your ego is what got you here. Like it might've been that, you saw a poster and you wanted to look that fit and you just, you wanted to look good and you wanted to feel good. And your ego is actually what walked your butt through the door. She's like, you're a different person now that you've been here for a number of years, but your ego is actually what got you here or that twinge of loneliness or that. And so it's really interesting how these voices for whatever they're worth, good and bad, can sometimes still propel us towards what we're supposed to or meant to do or what turns out really well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I've never, I've never heard anybody describe ego that way. Uh, is it, you know, uh, I mean, I am exceptionally hard on my ego probably more than most people. Cause I'm like, the ego is the source of all of my worst problems, but I've never, never thought of it that way. But I mean, the truth is it's, it's this battle with my ego that has led to so much of this work as well. Right. And so isn't it funny, like actually when we're mean to our ego, we're just doing more of what our ego does to us. Like (laughs) we're being cruel to the part that's being cruel to us. So it's kind of a never ending cycle. And so for me, sometimes to short circuit that cycle, I try to just like, like sprinkling salt or pepper on your eggs. I'm like, just add a little kindness. Like Mm -hmm. what's your ego saying? And and sometimes if I just turn around and I'm like, dude, yo, like what's up? (laughs) Like, are you okay? Like what's going on? And I, and I give it a little bit of niceness. It's like, well, well, Sarah, we just don't want to like be left out. Okay. Like we're just, we just, and then they kind of like get a little bit easier to deal with. And I don't know if you've ever read, um, Michael Singer's untethered soul. Have you ever heard of that book? I've heard the name of the book, but I, I don't think I've read it. Well, he is hilarious in how he describes like the voices and the chatter in your head. And I am not like disentangled enough to sink deep into meditation unless I'm moving and like swimming. And I'm sure you know this, Rini, because of surfing. Um, But but I am aware of the voices. And so he just describes them so perfectly because they're like, they're like, you wouldn't invite them over for coffee. If you imagined you were having a brunch and you tried to invite like the four or five different voices that are in your head over to brunch, you wouldn't invite them. They're not nice people. (laughs) Yeah, I would definitely have to agree with that. They're kind of a pain in the ass. Right. But giving them that like light side, you know, everything has a shadow side. So Uh what's the opposite of the shadow that's light. And what's the light side of this ego? It's like, Hmm, like, are you useful? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to listen to everything you say, but I am going to treat you with a dose of kindness. Uh Uh-huh. So let's do this. Let's, uh, let's talk about swing a little bit. I mean, I know swimming is this huge part of your life, so there's no way I'm letting you out of this conversation without, uh, mm-hmm. without talking about this. I mean, I, I, but what I'm really interested in, uh, more than the swimming itself is, is sort of, you know, your evolution as a swimmer. I mean, you go in as a walk on, then you go, you know, through all this hell, you know, to the point where you're competing nationally and now you're doing open water swims. I mean, uh, I remember, you know, reading about the, the Alcatraz stuff and thinking, I'm like, I've been in the San Francisco Bay. There's no way in hell I would put my foot in there without a wetsuit on. Uh, right. so, you know, I, so I want to talk about sort of your journey through, um, you know, going, getting to where you're at as a swimmer. And, and then, you know, we'll talk about how that sort of evolved, uh, and affected every other part of your life as well. Sure. 
swimming, I could talk about swimming forever and I try not to write about it too much because I feel like I tire people of it, but it's one of my favorite things. Um, let's go way back. So I remember when, when I was growing up, we were growing up in Palo Alto in California. Um, but we, we were a family with four kids and my mom was a stay at home mom and my dad was a PhD graduate student. So we had actually very little disposable income for the, um, the, however wealthy the town we lived in was. And so we didn't really do too many, um, I don't know, fancy after school activities, but we did get this membership. We did the AYSO soccer, our local soccer league, and we got this membership to the local pool. And when we got old enough, my mom said we all had to learn how to swim. It was just a requirement. And when we got old enough, we were allowed to join the swim team. And my mom, I was so mad at her. Um, she told me that swim practice was Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And so I, you know, put my cap on and I like put my little suit on and I walked down to the pool on time every, all three days. And I was so excited. And then one day on a Tuesday, I was like, I want to go to the pool. And my mom was like, okay. And so I went to the pool and there everyone was practicing without me. And I was livid. I was like, what, what is going on? Mom, why didn't you tell me? And it turns out she didn't want to burn me out because I have such a, a like high rate of starting things and then not finishing them. At least when I was younger, it's still kind of true today. Um, she didn't want me to like get overwhelmed. So she told me that practices were only three days a week and she wanted me to get used to it. Well, once I found out that they were five days a week, I went every single day. And that was my first introduction. I started around age eight and I went up till, um, through the end of high school, just doing the high school swim team and the local swim team. Mm -hmm. I mean, so yeah, when you get to college, I mean, you go through an experience in which, you know, you overcome numerous obstacles, it sounds like. I mean, I'd love to hear a bit about that and kind of how that's informed everything else in your life. Yeah, let's, let's, ooh, this is like a basket full of millions and millions of stories that I would love to tease apart. I don't know where to start. Let's see. Um, I remember when I applied for college, I, I chose a bunch of different sp places that I wanted to apply. And then after I realized that I wouldn't get to swim anymore, I thought, well, maybe I should look at the schools I applied to and see which one have swimming programs. And there was a small school in Ohio that had the number one swim team in the nation. Um, the previous year they had won nationals. And I was like, Whoa, well, that was one of my top choices. So I would love to go to this small liberal arts school and then also be able to swim. And we got in touch with the coaches and I ended up doing a visit. Um, and then I went to join the team and it was such a radical shift because when I first started, um, or when I was in high school, we were swimming five days a week after, after school. And when I got to college, we swam 10 times a week with two sessions of weightlifting, two sessions of plyometrics, um, as well in all of that practicing. And it was, we got up, I got up at 529 every day and we got to the pool and we started our, our workout by 550. Um, until 7.30 in the morning. And then after, after school every day, there was practices from about 2.20 until 4.30 and then another practice from 4.30 until 6.45. And you picked one of those. And then we also had a Saturday workout. And it was nuts. The first maybe six months while I was a freshman, when I was a first year walk on, I remember there were times when I tried to move my arms forward and I couldn't like my entire musculature collapsed. And I would I, like people, like I would try to get to the side of the wall. I could no longer lift my arms over my head. And, um, the coach would come over and coach was like six, seven, six, eight, this Italian man, giant. And he would come over and just scoop his two hands under my shoulders and just like lift me out of the pool. And then he'd throw a bunch of bags of ice at me and I'd sit there with ice on my shoulders. And sometimes I would just start crying and I couldn't stop crying. And he came over and he like kind of grabbed me by the chin once. Um, and that might not have been actually true, but that's what I feel like. So I'm saying that as, as like illustrative storytelling, cause he's a great guy. Um, and he looked at me and he was like, look, you have the potential to be great, but you right now, the only thing you need to do is not stop. He's like, I don't care if, if we do 600 and you only get through 500. I don't care if you like, just don't stop. Get in the slowest lane. You're going to be the slowest one in the pool. But if you can make it through this first semester, it might be life changing. And I remember him saying that to me. Um, and like, it was 
all I could do to just show up. And there were days when I got onto the pool deck and my body hurt so badly. And I like, I, I was about a hundred and I think I was about 132, 133 pounds when I left high school and I went to college and I lost weight when I first started because I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't even eat enough to get enough calories to, to do all the workouts that were now required of me. And I remember there are times when I would just sit uh, like, and I would try not to let anyone see, but my goggles would fill with tears before I got in the pool because it was, it was just so hard. Like it was, I remember it still, it was just like, I, there's no other way to explain it than it's just really hard. Um, and, and then there started to be some breakthroughs maybe at about three months and about four months in, and things didn't hurt quite so much. And I was able to race and compete and I was nowhere near my times that I was in high school. So I felt like a failure because I was going slower than what I thought I could do. And I, I just didn't see the window out. Like, how can you do this? Like, this isn't going to be possible. Um, and things really started to shift exactly as he said about the end of December and the beginning of January of my first year. And I had muscles that I could use. And by the end of my first year, I weighed in at about 148, 150 pounds. So I put on 15 pounds of muscle in my first year. Um, and when we did our final conference meet of the year, I, we do this thing called tapering where we slow down our workouts and we start to rest our bodies for one of the first times. And we got up on the block and I remember, um, I remember coach telling me the week before he just said, I really want you not to think about what you've done before because that might hold you back. Like how, what you think you're possible, what you think you're capable of is going to be really important and just start to play with the idea that it could be way better than you expected. And when I got on the blocks and I started doing my swims, every single one of my times just like dropped. I dropped two seconds, in, which is a huge amount in the swimming world, mm-hmm. it for, especially for a sprinter. And I don't know if people are associate, know much about times, but I dropped like two seconds in my 100 event. And I dropped, um, over the course of four years, I dropped 10 and a half seconds in my 200 events. And, and it just, I became like, I, I made my first national cut in that first year. And I was just bewildered and surprised. And I was this like... I was this lift, lean, just nimble bodied swimmer. And I had arrived as this kind of scrawny, pudgy, fleshy <laughs> freshman. Mm-hmm. So I, I love it. And that's why I asked the question because I knew there was going to be a lot more there. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. There are two themes that really stood out for me as, as you're telling this story. One is this idea of, of don't stop. And, and then the other is, you know, looking at, you know, thinking about the concept that, uh, of you know being capable of far more than you actually uh, uh, you know historically have shown to be capable of, and I guess what comes for me from that in terms of questions is how do we take that and and how do we translate that into our lives and and what we're doing? I mean, how do we bring that sort of resilience into what we do on a day to day basis and the mm-hmm. way we live? It's you know it's really an interesting question because I think I think for most corporate employees and, and also for a lot of projects, they're very murky and they're, they're in this like middle ground of mediocrity. That's not very exciting. You're not very motivated by it. And, um, you, there's no clarity around what you're doing or why you're doing it or where you're going. And so then you just end up in this muck. That's kind of same old, same old. And when you have more of a, I mean, this, this college swimming experience is all the recipes for a lot of success, which is do it with a group of people, put in the time, put in the hours, have mentors available. And then, and then also it's okay for it to be really, really challenging. Like that's actually where some of the best of our stuff comes from. Like when we crystallize greatness, it's not because we were just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. Like it's okay for it. And this is, this is something I talk to my clients about too, all the time. It's okay for it to be really, really hard. Like we, there should be like, we sometimes we have this collective fear of hard being bad. And those are two very different things. And I think just realizing like, first of all, like you don't know how much you've got until you test it. And so just go for it. And if it's hard and if you're crying and if you're building something at the end of the day and like it takes you being up a lot of the time or you have to do, you know, it might be worth it. Mm -hmm. So, and, and those kinds of experiences are far more satisfying than just being tired all the time and not knowing what you're doing and doing something for someone else. That's not very clear or defined. Like those are two very different things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's so much more that that's the start of, of what I'm feeling though. Do you ever want to quit? 
oh my God, all the time. I actually did. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, so much. Um, and, and then other times not at all. And, and it, it's really, it peers into the depths of your soul and asks you like, who are you is really what it does. The more you challenge yourself to grow, the more you find out who you are. Um, my junior year, my parents, no, my parents had finalized their divorce my freshman year. My junior year, oh God, it was a series of like, I don't know if anybody um, reads the Bible, but I felt like Job was my <laughs> was my book of the book of the year. Um, but it just was Murphy's Law: what could go wrong would go wrong. And I I got like pneumonia and bronchitis, and I dislocated my shoulder. I fell down a flight of stairs and broke my foot. Um, I. I don't even remember everything, the trials to tell you the truth, because it's been so long, but I just remember it was a year like none other. And I just kept picking myself back up and trying to keep going. And it was miserable. Um, the moment I broke my foot was just horrible because we had, we had just finished the second to last meet of the year and we were going into nationals and I was actually making chocolate chip cookies for all the people who didn't make it. And I was like, just trying to do this kindness for people. I was like, we love you. Like we love you teammates. You get, you guys did so great. And I was carrying two trays of cookie sheets, like one on each hand and the kitchen in our dormitory was uh, uh, down, down a level. So I was carrying these two trays down and I totally bit it. And these cookie trays went like flying out of my hands and I fell down the flight of stairs and there's like cookie dough everywhere. And, and like my foot just didn't feel good. And I ignored it. I, I went back upstairs. I hopped back upstairs. I was crying a little bit. I got the cookie dough. I got new cookie dough. I made more cookies and I went back stairs and I was like, I should probably ice this. And so I grabbed a whole bag of ice from the ice bucket, threw it on my foot and finished making the cookies. And the next day I woke up, my foot was probably four times as big as it normally is. And it had like purple stripes all over it. And it was February in Ohio. So there was ice all over the road and it was freezing. And I like slid down the hill to get to the pool. And I just, I literally tried to ignore it. I was like, I can't handle this. I really, like, I don't know what to do and got to the pool deck and the assistant coach came over and she, there was a lot of expletives that came out of her mouth and she was like, what did you do? <laughs> like, what's going on? Cause we remember we're like 10 days out from nationals and I'm one of the sprinters on the team. And I remember, this is a good story. So I'm, I'm segueing away from your question. Um, I remember my coach, he looked at my foot and he looked at me and he said, get in my office. And so I got in his office and he sat me down and goes, what is it? I said, I don't know. And he said, you think it's broken? And I said, I'm not sure yet. Um, it might be, it hurts a lot. And he goes, okay. Um, so we're going to decide now before you find out whether or not it's broken, whether or not you're going to nationals, which do you want? And I was like, what do you mean? Which do I want? I don't like, th I don't understand this question. If it's broken, he goes, no, no, no. Let's reframe this. Either you're going or you're not going. And this is up to you and your mental framework. And if you're going, I don't want to hear about your foot at all for the next two weeks. And if you're not going, you have a broken foot and you're sitting on the bench. And it kind of blew my mind and it was really a difficult decision to make, but it was a kindness that he did. Because what he, when I decided, I said, actually, I'm going, he's like, great, we're going to come up with strategies for how you can deal with this. And we're going to talk about pain tolerance. And we're going to talk about all of this stuff in a very analytical way. Um, and, and it never became a crutch that I was allowed to use. I wasn't allowed to say, oh, I didn't do that well because I have a broken foot. And so I, I, we ended up taking, we all went to the national meet and I swam with a broken foot. I relearned how to do a start. You can either do a track start, which is one foot forward and one foot back, or you can do a two-legged start. And I learned how to do a two-legged start so I could punch off my right foot. And adrenaline actually carries you through pain. So when you get up on the blocks and you have, uh, like that big starting block goes off and you have this like pow, you don't actually feel anything. I didn't feel anything until after I got out of the pool and it, and it actually didn't hurt that much because after two weeks it had started to self heal. And, um, I, I had it wrapped most of the time and I was icing it. And the doctor had confirmed that, um, like I wouldn't be doing aggressive damage to it if I kept using it, which was also a relief. But, um, after that epic year of kind of pushing through, I, I gave up. I got, I finished the national meet. I did what I did. And then I put my swim cap down and I walked into my coach's office two weeks later. And I just said, I, I don't think I can make it. 
I just don't think I want to swim next year. I quit. And he was pretty, pretty frustrated with me. And I went, I went home to um, California and I had a job out there and I was working uh, as a sales person in a, in a garden center where I was selling plants and I was telling people all about plants. And occasionally I would go to the YMCA and swim a couple thousand yards, like once or twice a week. But for all intents and purposes, I got real fat and real lazy. Like I just got pudgy and soft and, and, and I didn't swim. And at the end of August, I finally wanted to swim again, finally wanted to do it again. And so I reached out to my coach and I said, you know, I, like, I, I think I still want to swim. Is that okay? And he was like, yeah, we'll take you back. And, um, I was in the slowest lane again. I was super slow and I made friends with all the freshmen. I was a senior. I made friends with all the freshmen and, uh, the body of work that I had built into my physical body ended up working out so well. I, um, that was the year I actually, so I was really slow again for the first couple of months and then I just started to take off. And so, by the time the, the final meet came around, we went to our conference meet and I won every single event that I was in. I was just like sweeping everything up and it was exhilarating. And my ego was there being, saying things like, oh, you're not that good. You're not. And, and it was just kind of like, but it happened anyways. And, and it was a really nice end of the career, at least the college career. And then I kept swimming afterwards, as you know, in the Alcatraz craziness. Mm-hmm. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. You know, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's, there's so many profound lessons and takeaways, uh, to, to everything you're saying for me. I mean, this whole idea of not stopping, uh, you know, there's two things here that really stood out to me and you kept showing up no matter how miserable you were. Uh, and then you didn't let your, a broken foot be a crutch. So I guess the, the, you know, my, my next two questions are, then we'll wrap up this segment of our conversation, uh, are one, how do we get through this misery? I mean, because I can tell you there are moments in, in building everything that I have that I've been pretty miserable. Uh, I mean, everybody knows I still live at home. Uh, and I was willing to go through that pain of, of doing something that would come with a lot of stigma and judgment from people, probably even people who listen to the show thinking, what the hell? Uh, <clears throat> but I, I wasn't going to let that be the deterrent from where I was supposed to ultimately end up. And, and, and then I finally learned not to use it as a crutch because, you know, I, I've said this before, for a while, my circumstances of this situation were my identity. And because mm-hmm. the two were intertwined, my life reflected that. So I'm curious, one, how you fight through the pain and show up when it's miserable and how you ditch your crutches. Mm, mm. Oh, okay. Both of these are really good questions. And I just want to reemphasize the first one, which is don't be afraid to be miserable. I mean, it sucks, right? Like no one, like diarrhea sucks. Puking sucks. <laughs> right? Like, like I know these things, like when you're in the middle of them, you're like, oh my God, this is never ending. I want to no, like, just like, I'll trade anything to make this stop. Like being miserable sucks, but don't be afraid of it. Right. Like it, there's profoundness in it. There's wisdom in it. It shows who you really are. Like, you know, watch somebody when they're in the best of time. Times, they're great people. Watch somebody in the worst of times and you see who they really are. And I'm not wishing terrible times on everyone, but 
don't be afraid to be miserable. And, and if people need examples of this, one of, one of the things I love to do actually is just read history, like read the histories of people who have created your, the greatest works that you admire, because they're not these beautiful little stories. And if people have written them as beautiful stories, remember that that's writing and that might not actually be true. Um, because people who are living the life and living the experience are often going through, I mean, Mark Twain was an insurance salesman. Like he wrote his books at night. He wrote his books after he could finish his job, make the paycheck. Like a lot of the people we admire the most are the loneliest, weirdest, strangest, most miserable people ever. So if <laughs> like if we're looking for doing great work and if that's the priority, and I, I would argue that like doing great work and having great love are some of the biggest, biggest, if not the ultimate things in life, mm-hmm. um, then, then like there's, then you're just going to get the gamut of emotions and some of it's going to be not so good. I actually, I think that, I think that society like preaching right now, the, the do what you love, follow your passion, everything should be great. Happiness ideal is actually doing a lot of people a disservice because yeah. then they chase after things that just feel good and things that just feel good right now are McDonald's and sitting on my couch and watching a movie. And then I feel like shit later because I haven't actually done any, cause I know I'm capable of more part of my French. I think yeah. I swore. No, I, 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 I'm not <laughs> slowing you down. This is brilliant. It's, it's genius. And I, I do love that you brought up that, that idea that so much of it is doing a disservice to us. I mean, it's interesting, you know, I mean, as, you know, as of this morning, we, we published an episode with Pam Slim where she was talking, she said, you know, there's this sort of escape from cubicle nation. She said, that's one conversation that's happening. And she said, you know, to some degree, that conversation has made a lot of us really miserable. Yes. It's it's really when you look at that, you're like, oh, quit your job, you know, travel the world, you know, whatever, escape the escape the nine to five, everything that actually like the pressure that that's what you should be doing, I think, has really honestly, it's I think it's caused much more. more misery. Harm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's caused a lot more misery than good. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and I love, I love what you said about Pam because, because it, it is a narrative. We're all like, oh, we can escape and just be happy. And I actually think much of, and in my experience, much of the root of happiness comes from good old hard work, Mm -hmm. like really diving in and becoming a master of something Mm -hmm. and, and using my body and my mind and my capabilities to the full potential and to really push myself into those areas. I mean, everything I, everything I'm doing right now is like, it's still, I love it. And it makes me miserable. It's kind of a paradox because Mm -hmm. I'm reaching and stretching and trying these like really hard things. And that doesn't mean every yoga class I go to is this blissful paradox where I'm in a Zen moment. No, there's some, there's sometimes when I try and I try and I try and I try and it's miserable. And, and so just, it's a, it's okay. Right. I feel like we need permission. Like it's okay to not feel good. It's actually, Oh, here's another good one. It's actually a wayfinding signal. Like pain is our body and our mind's way of talking to us. Mm -hmm. It's like, don't do that right? Like you touch a hot pot and it's like, no, (laughs) right. It's actually a really loud signal. And if we start to listen to those signals, right? Like we're miserable at our job. It's like, Oh, don't do that. So sometimes this is, this is a different instance and I'm, I'm changing what I'm saying, which may confuse a lot of people, but (laughs) but sometimes, um, sometimes pain is good just because it's a voice to talk to us. And other times it's us just discovering who we are. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? You know, like I would love it if every surf session involved not taking waves on the head, but I mean, the last time I got let go from a job, the next day I went out and tried to surf a 13 foot day in Nicaragua. And I mean, I nearly drowned. I thought I was going to die. And it, it it, like suddenly it put what had happened the day before getting let go from the job in perspective. I was like, wow, I guess that's not such a big deal. Right. Actually, sometimes I feel like it's the universe or the world just kind of being like, <laughs> like laughing at us because it's like, it's so much bigger than you can even imagine. Like you are, you're like, your misery at your job is so s- small right now in mm-hmm. this moment, in this little piece of time. Cause there's so much more like a wave can crash on your head. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of misery at jobs, let's, uh, let's shift gears a little bit. And, sure. uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I think that, you know, you've talked about doing good work and, and really all of this. I and mean, we've spent a lot of time talking about things that are important, things that feel good. And, you know, you being somebody who has this deep seated need to move your body, you, you, you know, you mentioned going into a job and within two minutes knowing 
that it was going to be the wrong thing and then staying there for five years. Oh God. I mean, yes. talk to us about that conflict. I mean, that, that can't, I can't imagine that didn't tear you up inside to some degree, but also, um, you know, I, I don't imagine that, you know, even though we've just literally said the opposite of this by saying, Hey, be miserable at your job and be okay with it. Right. I, I can't imagine that there aren't people feeling exactly what you're feeling. And, and you know, really, I, I guess really what I would say is there's almost a lack of environmental resonance in these situations mm-hmm. because I, I, I don't think it's about escaping the job. I think it's about putting yourself in a situation in which there is environmental resonance. Mm, what do you mean environmental resonance? Like feels good? Like Well, I think a combination or- of feels good. But then the other thing I would say is that if your talents aren't matched with your environment, mm-hmm. you are going to fail. I know this because this is my story. Like I've realized yes. I've been fired from every job I've ever been at because I was at the wrong damn job. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what, um, Robert Cooper in this book I'm reading right now called the other 90% has some interesting things to say about this because he says, and I, uh, lots of research says this, but we each have our own unique talents and it's, and there aren't that many of them, mm-hmm. right? It's not like most people are wild, wildly talented as a collective. We're all wildly talented, but you personally have a couple you have a handful of really interesting, unique things that you can do better than most people. Um, those are your areas of expertise or your areas of, and maybe it's like cartooning or maybe it's just being a good listener or a good hugger, like, but you have a couple of things that you're really good at and disproportionately so compared to other people. And it's our job over time to begin to listen to those cues and those voices, which are like, what can I get lost in? What feels good? You know, what, what do I do just because it's fun for me? And what am I naturally good at? Um, And what, what kind of skills can I develop? And that, I don't, I don't know about you, but for me, the art of listening to that intuition and inner wisdom takes a while. You know, I know now that my inner wisdom was telling me the moment I walked in, but at the time, all I could tell you was probably that it didn't feel quite right, but I didn't know any better. Mm -hmm because I hadn't had any other experiences. I hadn't had another job to tell me that this wasn't right. I just, I kind of knew it didn't feel right, but I wasn't quite so sure. And over time, as you start to find your right people and your right talents and your right job and your right space, it becomes, for me at least, easier and easier to discern and say, nope, that didn't work. And uh, now I know I've been through this experience that's not the right shape of the environment for me. I need, you know, I, like I work best with these people in this type of environment and I'm really good at these kind of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's kind of, you know, sort of pie in the sky, you know, wishful thinking that you're going to figure this out without any trial or error, trial and error. I mean, I, I think that you kind of have, you know, I would say you want to learn how to surf, you got to take a few waves on the head. A hundred percent. And if you want to learn how to surf, it, the first thousand of them might be waves on the head. (laughs) You know, that's the other thing that's really hard because like there's, you have to pay attention a little bit to this, this intuition and this inner wisdom, but give yourself the grace of experience and like commitment and trying things out for, for a decent amount of time, you know, six months, a year, two years. Um, you, like it's okay if you don't know right away and, and experiment, I'd say experiment with both sides because some people like the beautiful Amber Ray has just this wonderful sense of intuition and she just knows like in an instant and she's honed that wisdom and she can just be like, doesn't feel right. I know it. And, um, other people like it takes a little bit longer. And so kind of finding that middle ground where, okay, this time I'm going to try following what I feel, mm-hmm. right? Because this is going to be one experiment of many. And then afterwards reflect, like, how did it feel? Did I make the right decision? Because I've made decisions based on what I think is intuition and then regretted it later. Mm-hmm. And I just add that to my arsenal where I'm like, okay, actually, I need a better reading on what I think that I'm feeling because the outcome wasn't what I expected. And then other times I wait far too long. You know, what what where I should leave within two months or three months or six months, it took me two or three years. And I'm like, you know what? Next time that comes up, I'm leaving way quicker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you've, you've more or less described the entire process of how the art of being unmistakable was written pretty much through intuition. Oh yeah. I, that book went just crazy. I remember when it was like Glenn Beck, right? And he, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> I, I have so many questions to ask you about that. I need, I'm getting you on my interview series after this so that I can get <laughs> you in the room and ask you about your stories. 
Well, so speaking of writing, uh, you know, I, I think that this is what a lot of people are going to want to hear from you about because I, I think you're very much admired as a writer on the internet. I mean, you have a very distinctive voice as a writer, uh, hmm. and, and you have a way of assembling words. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I got a, a slight dose into your, you know, a, a little peek into your creative process uh, when we sat down at dinner. I mean, I was like, what I saw was a mad woman writing in a journal every second she got. <laughs> I was like, wow. I'm like, and and remember, you know, just a few days ago, I said on one of my Facebook status updates, I said, you know, I'm like, I wonder how much of that has come across my way without me even realizing it in your mm. writing. So l- let's talk about this. I mean, you're, you're really somebody, somebody who has taken the craft of writing very seriously. And I, I, you know, it's, it's part of why I wanted to have you here. And, and I, I want to dig deep into this and really hear your thoughts around this. Oh, so many good things. So you, I teach a couple of writing classes, one's on storytelling, one's um, storytelling and writing, and the other one's on content strategy. So it helps people take all of the mess and jumble in their brains and put it onto paper. Like, Because most people aren't short of ideas. They actually have far too many, and then they get frustrated. They don't know how to start. And so we map it. We like tease it out. We map it out through all these fun exercises. Um, writing is is, oh, so many things. I think... I'm going to start deeper down with the philosophy because we've been having such a good conversation here. And I don't say this out loud as many times as I should. Um, for me, I teach, uh, and I'm using air quotes here, writing course, right? That's what I teach on the surface. But, but my deeper belief is really that, um, we are all in, in need of connection to ourselves and connection to each other. Because when I look at the root of a lot of, a, a lot of the problems that we have, we're lonely. We are disconnected, we're lonely, and we're not only disconnected from each other in a bit of a fragmented society, but we're also disconnected from our true selves. And we don't know who we are. And so we're kind of miserable, and we're kind of bored, and we're kind of lonely, and we don't know why. And so I teach writing as one mechanism for gaining access to your inner wisdom and your inner soul. And so I give you a lot of skills and tools about one way to use your voice. But the deeper, the deeper kind of philosophy is that you are this brilliant creation. You, if you imagine it as like a, a glowing ball of white light, like you are an orb and a brilliant piece of creation. And the layers of experience and the world that you live in and the voices in your head and your ego are like little clusters of black plaque that have lined this beautiful orb of glowing light. So much to the point that there's film and there's dust all over it. And that's, some people would say that's our body. Some people would say that's our mind, but it's the worldly manifestations of the the way that the world that we live in. And so when we're trying to access this beautiful, bountiful, like inner wisdom and soul and spirituality, whatever you want to call it, um, we have these little lifelines that we can use to share our words and our stories. And it's talking and it's touching and it's seeing and it's writing and it's everything that we've learned about interacting and engaging. And so one of these little lifelines is writing. And I think it's very, very powerful to know how to tell your own story because if you ac- you have access to what you actually think and, and who you actually are, it can be a very empowering thing. And so then I package that up and I call it a writing class. Um, In my own life, I think this is what you were asking actually, was (laughs) uh, I spend a lot of time writing. I I try to write every single day. I get up in the morning and I write a couple of pages and I don't profess that it's good. It's like Julia Cameron in the morning pages. Mm -hmm. It's just chicken scratch. Like some mornings I'm writing like an ode to how much I want my coffee. (laughs) <laughs> like I'm like, and like, it's so bad. I'm like, coffee, 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 coffee. Am I done yet? Did I get there? Like, I'm just whining on the page and other mornings it's to do lists. Cause I wake up in such an like urgency and such an like adrenaline fueled state. I'm like, Oh my God, I have so much to do. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm really panicked. Oh my God. Blah, blah, blah. And so I'm just like, I just literally write a to do list. And I just, and what it does is it kind of cleanses your brain. It's like, it's like just a little wash. It just gets some of that junk and that garbage off. And then I get to think a little clearer through the day. And just like in swimming where I might have a shitty day and then an okay day and then a much better day, it's this rhythm of being, of getting into the flow. And when I find, when it finally clicks, it's not because I showed up and I had two, it is because I showed up and I had two terrible days. It's because I committed to the act of creating. Mm -hmm. And then 
after carving and whittling a little bit and just writing these God awful essays that no one would want to read, including myself, I finally arrive at a moment where my voice is clearer. It's more lucid. I'm, I'm fluent. And so for me, when you see me scribbling all the time, it's just because I want to have access to my words. And the more that I scribble, the less I have to think about Should I write? When should I write? What does writing look like? Do I use a Word document? Do I use a Moleskin? How do I do this? Is someone thinking of me? Should I do it now? How about later? No, you shouldn't do it now. Like, I just get rid of that by doing it as much as I can. And so that I know that whenever I have a thought or something that feels like it's good or feels like I want to write about it, I have permission to write about it because it's just a habit. Mm Mm-hmm. I love it. I don't, I don't really know what else to say. Uh, <laughs> I don't have much to add. I'll, I'll share one thing, uh, that, that my friend, uh, Brian and I were talking about. He, you know, I'm glad you brought up that idea of flow states, uh, because I think that people are under the impression that, you know, like when, when, when people ask me, how do I produce something every day? I think they're under the impression that I sit down and that's what just comes out. I'm like, uh, right. no, no. What you read takes what Sarah was talking about. And, you know, it's interesting. My friend Brian was telling me that he was watching this documentary about this video game maker uh, in Japan who I think made the, the latest Gran Turismo. He's apparently like the Steve Jobs of video games. And one of the things they talked about in that movie is that people who are peak performers at anything are, apparently are only in flow states about 15% of mm-hmm. the time. And the rest of the time, they're working to get into the flow state. You know, that reminds me actually, amen, first of all, like we're just, you show up and you practice, you practice and you practice and you practice. And that's why I encourage so many people. And that's why the blog that I write right now is called, it starts with, because I encourage people just to get started, right? Like that little moment where it's like, Just writing one sentence every day is going to be more for you than anything else because you've given yourself permission to open that Word document and write a sentence. And so many people just crash and burn or they like collapse on themselves and say, oh, no, I'm not going to get even started. And I want to I want to share with you one one thing. And I think it's called the zero odds ratio, zero odds something. I wish I knew the name. We'll have to link it up in the comments afterwards. But but the idea is this. For all of the researchers out there, people who are publishing academic papers, and I have to credit James Clear because he's the one that told me about this. So also, if I get it wrong, I'm blaming James Clear. Um, <laughs> he said, uh, or, or so the thinking goes, that the researchers have to publish a certain number of academic papers. And when you look at the body of work that people produce, the chances, the people who produce the best a- academic papers, like the ones that are well-known and well-read, aren't some isolated set of people that just happen to write really good things. They actually have an equal odds ratio of producing really crappy papers. Mm -hmm. The people who produce the most best work are the people who produce the most work. So somebody who writes 10 books has a better chance of having a New York Times bestseller than somebody who writes zero books, right? That's pretty obvious. But so many people put so much weight on that one time or that one chance, just like that one essay or that one day that you're writing. And it's like, this has got to be the one that they fail to even start when the best predictor of success is just quantity. Mm-hmm. I love it. You know, it, it, so I'm going to add one other thing to this and uh, we'll, yes, we'll start please. wrapping things up. If you want proof of this, um, I, I had a virtual assistant once. I said, you know what? Can you do me a favor? Because I was trying to put together a list of you know, books of all the people who've been on the show. And so I said, can you do me a favor and go to Amazon and get links to everything Seth Godin has ever written? Mm. And what you find will shock the hell out of you because some of it is just complete crap. Right. Seth Godin. Like, I think there's a book called Email Addresses of Famous People. Can you imagine? Like, this is a guy that more or less every one of us looks up to. And there is a reason. Because yeah. he was willing to do exactly what you're talking about. Right. Most things are like, I mean, aside from killing people and a couple other things, most things are recoverable. Like if you make a giant mistake or you put something out there, like I know that we live in a challenging politically correct world, but just put it out there because you are allowed to say later, I changed my mind mm-hmm. or, huh, that actually wasn't that good. Yeah. You know? And when I look back at my writing, it's like, and I, I'm sure that this will happen again in two years time and two years after that, I look back and I'm like, oof, oh, could have been so much better. And literally the only way to get there is to go through it. And yeah, Seth Godin. So he wrote some crappers. Okay. Right. What do we remember him for? Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, I feel the same way about stuff that I've created earlier. I mean, if I go back and listen to old interviews, I'm like, this sucks. I can't believe we published this. Right. Yeah. And yet, and yet here you are, it's pretty cool. No, it's pretty cool. Like, like I, and, and, and this is, I, I actually think this is, we're so quick and this is, this is a paradox of storytelling because stories are, we tell stories because they're easy to remember. And so we're constantly simplifying the world around us in order to understand it. But we tell stories about people around us too. And so we're so quick to judge because we want to define people. And so we're like, oh, that person is bad at writing and we'll just put them in a box, you know, put mm-hmm. them to the side. And when rather it's so much more complex and I, I love it. I love it when my friends grow up and when you give them permission to change, like you see somebody and they're pushing stuff out time and time and time again. And it's like, not that good. And yet they're the ones publishing. And then a year later you go back and you start reading their stuff and it's like, oh wow, this is getting pretty good. And then a year later they're writing really great work and they're starting to get known for it. And then a year later they have a bestseller. And then, and then you watch somebody come up to them and say, yeah, I'm not as good at writing as you. I like, I just won't start because I'm not as talented as you. And you're just like, no, 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 that's not the way it works. This person has put in their hours. They have been working hard and, and, and it's been beautiful to watch them change. You know, it's, it's, I I love that because the truth is, I mean, I still look at people like you and Amber and I'm like, wow, you guys are so much better than I am. (laughs) No, (laughs) like it's, it's, you know, but I mean, I think that like the idea that you'll lose that, I think is, is one of the myths, right? Like you'll get to this moment when you're like, well, yeah, now I'm just badass. And like, yeah, it's really weird how that completely just goes away. Like it, it, or you don't even think that that is always there, but like your ego kind of just dissipates in that moment for some reason, when you actually have one of these big successes, you're like, is this actually happening to me? Right. Right. And then you have all these other challenges because every new situation has its new like tests and trials and tribulations. And then you're dealing with all sorts of different things. Like, uh, you know, holy crap, how do I answer a hundred thousand emails? And wow, I need to learn to not take comments personally. Cause I'm getting a lot of comments and some of them are hater. How do I deal with hater email? What happens now? You know, stuff like yeah. that. It's yeah. just, there's always new stuff to deal with. So, um, you know, we're getting close to about an hour. I, I want to wrap with uh, my final question, but I want to do this a bit differently. Mm. Uh, I mean, you've swam, you've done the Alcatraz swim to me. That's, yes. that's, you know, a demonstration of grit on so many levels. And I am really, you know, I mean, when I look at a lot of what has happened in the last four years and, and I look at people who are successful, people who are unsuccessful. I mean, I've seen people, I have seen people for, for, you know, for metaphorically speaking, who started the swim with us and they probably got eaten by a shark somewhere along the way. And I mm-hmm. want to know what the difference is between the people who make it back to shore and the ones who don't. Ah, uh, um, hmm. hmm. It's a really interesting question. Well, first of all, I hope they weren't all eaten by sharks. I hope they just like <laughs> got on a boat and decided to go sailing because that was their life's calling. So, and then if they did get eaten by sharks, I hope that there was like a warm, wonderful shark's belly or they're reincarnated as something else beautiful. But, <laughs> um, you know, I think I, I do like this question about grit and determination. And I think resiliency is a really, a really big key word of mine. Um, you know, like keep swimming, keep on going. It's like, I mean, everything I'm going to say is going to sound so trite, but like there aren't that many days and like you're lucky to have them and keep going. Um, and it's, it's Corbett Barr. I think he wrote to me this really interesting quote. I don't know where he got it from, but the amount that you can accomplish in a day is pretty small. And the amount that you can accomplish in 30 days is pretty big. And it's the same thing for swimming back from Alcatraz. Like when I am out at that Island and I look back at San Francisco and it's these tiny dots of light on a black Hill and it's pitch black. Cause I get up really early and I swim. I actually don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't think I, my mind can comprehend it because what I'm about to do is leave all motor vehicles and adornments behind and get in the bay without a wetsuit and trust my body to pull myself from one side of the bay to another. And there's no, like, I can't put all my effort into one stroke. It's not like one master stroke is somehow going to sweep me from one side to the other. And yet 
you just kind of keep going. And I, it's just, sometimes I have to count to myself in there. Like, like I count my strokes. I just start counting to 10 and I count up to 10 and then I keep going until I get to a hundred. And then I keep going and right in the middle is the worst because you look like you're not moving anywhere. You like keep, I keep looking up and sighting and the same buildings are the same distance far away and Alcatraz is far away. And I'm very aware of the fact that it's like me and my cold body and, and nothing else. And the bubbles from the goggles start to dance in front of my eyes. And sometimes I get really scared because it looks like there are sharks swimming below me because there's all these like light bubbles, like whooshing in front of me. And my mind can go into really dark places. And I just, I have to really focus on my breathing and realize it's okay. Keep going. And once I settle into the habits and the systems that I've learned over time and focus on concentrating my effort just on doing what I know how to do, which is to keep moving my arms back and forth, eventually I get there. And it's pretty remarkable. I think that makes a uh, perfect and poetic way to sum up our conversation. I'm not even going to touch it. Uh, <laughs> Sarah, thank you. know, I, I have to say, I'm not surprised. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I at this point, you know, speaking of intuition, I have an intuitive sense for who is going to be a big hit with our audience. And I am positive that you will be. So, uh, I can't thank you enough for, I'm taking the time to join us and <clears throat> share some of this with our listeners. I mean, I'm very, very happy you reached out to me. Oh, thank you so much. It was just a delight to be here. And I hope these stories really like just help people encourage them to be as awesome as they already are. Thanks, Serini. Yeah. And uh, for those of you guys listening, we'll close the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.